Welcome aboard, everyone. This is Adam for realhomerecording.com. This will probably be one of the most informative videos I've put out all year long. And I don't know how long this is going to take to record, so it might be split up into three pieces, or it might all be one video. Regardless, I want to give you guys a lot of good information, and um, this is actually one of the videos that was going to be a part of Real Home Recording Premium, but I decided to scrap that idea. The whole idea of uh, the premium videos, eh, wasn't working, so, you know, I don't care. Let's do it, right? So this video is called Old School Music Engineering or Audio Engineering Philosophy in the Box. And what that means is I want to take what the old school engineers did and still do to this day and talk about how it's done in software. Because we are at the point where digital signal processing is of a very high quality it wasn't the case even three or four years ago, but actually, that's not exactly true, but really over the past three years, things have gotten insane with in-the-box plugins, and I want to relate that to how those old-school engineers used to do things and get the sound that they were able to get. So I got to start off by talking about monitoring. Monitoring is the key to good recordings, good mixes, and good masters. I would say half the problem with new engineers is that what they're hearing is not what they're getting. Now, there's no standard for audio like there is um, for photography. It's sRGB. You calibrate your monitor to the sRGB standard. And then that means that when you go and color correct your photos and then you send them to the lab, what you get and what you see on your screen is pretty much what you get in the prints. In the television world, we have the REC709 standard, which is kind of similar to sRGB, but not exactly the same. That is done by calibrating your monitor and by calibrating your monitor, it will look good on the most amount of TVs, or at least that's the idea. It's a lot better than Simpty was back in the good old days of NTSC. Anyway, with sound, we don't really have a standard, but what we do have is this cool little test or experiment or whatever you want to call it that JBL did, JBL, the speaker manufacturers, they took the frequency response curves of all these different consumer speakers, added them all together, and what they got is a flat frequency response. Now, where did I hear this information? I heard this from famous mastering engineer Bob Ludwig, whose interview I will link to in the video description. So if Bob Ludwig says mixing, mastering, recording, with a flat frequency response is ideal, I'm going to listen to this guy. It makes the most sense, correct? So how do you get a flat frequency response? Number one, you need to have good, a lot of times they call them reference speakers, but that's kind of a marketing term. You really need to have a neutral speaker, and that speaker needs to sound neutral in the room that you mix, record, and master in. Easier said than done. Uh, truth be told, I mix and master usually with my Klipsch Pro Media speakers, but my uh, my secret, which I've talked about several times, I think this is probably the sixth time I've mentioned it. It's a plugin from IK Multimedia called ARC, and uh, they released version two of their plugin I think a year or two ago. And what it does is it tries to get your speakers and the speakers in your room to sound as flat as possible. You can also change it to different curves um, to kind of simulate what it sounds like on different speakers. But when I'm mixing, mastering, recording, I have it set to flat. These work pretty well. Ever since I've started using ARC back in, I think, 2009, ARC has absolutely changed the way that I'm able to mix and master. 
and record. I haven't really had a chance to record with it much, but no doubt if I were able to record more with it on, it would make an even more substantial uh, change to the way I'm able to mix and master. Again, if what you're hearing isn't accurate, then all the rest of it is harder to do. And I didn't really understand this until I got ARC. And, um, you know, that's really where I say you're, the largest part of your budget should go to monitors. At Studio B, we use the Yamaha HS80Ms. And the H... I'm going to get this wrong. It's the, the subwoofer, the, the H something 10... I don't even know what the hell it's called. It's sitting behind me, but I... <laughs> I guess I could go look at it, but um, I'll put it on screen what the actual name is. It's the subwoofer that complements the, the Yamahas. Are these the best speakers? Probably not. Are they what, I, what we can afford? What we were able to afford? What I'm able to afford? I would say yes, and then you combine that with ARC and some basic room treatment, and you have a much better control room to mix in. Again, I most of the time I'm mixing and mastering on my clip speakers. I have a cathedral ceiling in Studio A, luckily. Uh, so reflections aren't that big of a deal. But they're definitely not as nice as the Yamahas. But they do get the job done, and I'm pretty darn happy with them. Whatever you can afford, that's what you got to use. But I would definitely budget in ARC because ARC I can't stress it enough this plugin has made the biggest impact on the, my ability to mix record and master and deliver that without having to go back and remix and remix and remix and like you know you know you chase yourself you chase your own tail in circles until you finally say you know what this thing's worth it and when we got it I think it cost us it was actually 600 bucks but there was some deal going on a cross grade deal and we got it for 400 um but knowing what i know now 600 dollars would have been you know I, w I, I would have spent that no problem but the um this plugin i think now cost you can sometimes get it for 200 dollars normally it's 300 but if you wait for a sale or something, you can get it for 200 And that includes a microphone that you can use that sounds pretty decent as well. Sorry for taking so much time to talk about that. It's really important to understand how important monitoring is to the rest of the chain. Because this entire video is pointless without talking about that. So, on to what I call the recording chain. Now, most of us probably record with a simple solid state preamp. Nothing too fancy. Myself, I use Mackie XDR2 and I record with the insert output so that it bypasses the EQ section. There's this rect out on the mixing board that I use, but I'm like, you know, I don't want to... All the specs on the board are based on the inserts and when you bypass the EQ, which I don't use anyway, I record flat that's uh you know you, you gain the advantage of getting the purest preamp tone out of that the other thing i use are m audio octane preamps in my fast track ultra um yeah my fast track ultra interface but um either way those both are direct methods you know i don't know what you use if you have a hardware eq that's awesome. If you also have a hardware compressor, that's awesome as well. Take advantage of that stuff if it's good gear, but I'm, um, I'm assuming most of the people listening to this have a pretty basic recording chain. With that in mind, again, keep in mind when you record, you want to go for, uh, I don't like to go past negative 10 dB. That's, uh, am I looking at this? No, that's negative 12. If I pull it over, it might Okay, so somewhere around here is negative 10. You'll see it on the on your meter, but I don't like clipping past negative 10. You can you can uh, I'm going to link to the proper audio recording levels video. That one's important. So once you got all that situated, now I'm going to open this up <laughs> and talk about uh so again, the typical chain. Actually, I didn't really talk about that. 
There is a video. I will also link to this in the video description. It is the Chris Lord Algae Slate Digital Drums Sample Library Making of Video. And if you watch Chris Lord Algae, which is, he is one of the biggest names in mixing, but he's also a recording engineer, obviously. And um, if you watch what he's doing, number one, he's recording in an awesome sounding room. This can't be overstated. You need to find the best room in your house or wherever you record at. You need to find the best room to record in. And if you need to either get your instrument or instruments set up by a professional, if you don't know what you're doing, like I don't know what I'm doing, you know, to get a better guitar sound or a better drum sound, you know, you can replace your heads, get it tuned up. But if you really don't know what you're doing, hiring somebody to do that isn't, you know, again, if you're only recording an album here and there, like maybe once every few years, it is worth the money to get a technician to come and uh, make sure things sound good. Or in the case of a guitar, a nice Luther who knows what he's doing to get your, uh, your guitar into good shape or whatever your instrument may be. Again, renting is an option. A lot of music stores, you can rent instruments. And the better the quality, the easier it is down the line with mixing and mastering. So... That being said, watch the Chris Lord Algae video. It goes, it, it complements this video because if you watch what he does, number one, he's recording in an awesome sounding room. He is using awesome microphones. He is using awesome preamps. He's using the, the, the Neeb 1081 EQs on those awesome preamps. And they are going to probably really nice converters. Okay, converters are... Modern converters sound good, period. I use an old M-Audio Delta 1010 interface, which does the job. Again, the biggest difference that I heard when I took that Delta 1010 out of Studio B and put it in Studio A's kitchen, which is being remodeled still, but the remodeling added a nice cathedral ceiling it was a high ceiling you know larger than 12 feet um i've never recorded in a big room like that recorded drums in a big room because most houses don't have big rooms like that um most middle class houses i should say (laughs) and um you know to hear that i'm just like you know this is this is it this is what this is why it's so important to record in a nice room. And, and what, before all the drywall went up, I think it sounded even better. The, 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 the decay in that room was more natural and um, it just sounded nice. But even with the drywall up, it still sounded really good. Okay, so the recording room, the microphones, look, you know, we all can't afford nice Neumann U87s, U67s, you know, uh, AKG 414s. I think he was using like a... Um, <laughs> A C12 microphone, which I think is like between three and five thousand dollars. Ridiculous. Look, us home recording guys don't have these cool tools to work with. We do have cool substitutes that work okay. Um, myself, for uh, U67 replacements, I uh, use AT4040 Audio Technica AT4040 microphones. Again, for recording drums. My overheads are Shure SM81s, which, by the way, I w- I'm going to be rec- uh, doing reviews on all the audio gear that we have, that I have access to very, very shortly. I've th- This channel has been lacking hardware reviews, and I'm finally going to get around to doing that and providing as many sound samples as I can for those microphones. Now... The other thing you see him doing, again, he has EQs, hardware EQs. We're going to have to um, take care of that problem with some of our own here. So what I what I have, FabFilter Pro Q2. Unfortunately, my license expired for it for the demo right when my computer broke. <laughs> I was going to do a review on this EQ. Um, I messed around with it before my computer broke and... I loved it. The The sound of this thing, if you 
are having issues with the quality of your instrument, the quality of your microphone, this plugin will help you a lot with that. I recommend this plugin for cutting. It is a great clean EQ. It, it, it also boosts nicely too, don't get me wrong. But what I like to do is pretend that, okay, I might not have the best instrument. I might, may not have placed the microphone exactly where it should have been, or the microphone I was using wasn't the best. But this equalizer, when you use a clean equalizer, it simulates recording a really awesome instrument. By the way, we are definitely doing this track by track because when you record something, when you're sitting there in front of hardware with your EQ, what are you doing? You're, you're going to ask the drummer in this case or the guitarist, hey, play your guitar for me. This is after getting it to the point where you can adjust like you know, the guitar tone knobs on the guitar itself, on the amp itself. And by the way, that's why I suggest putting the amplifier, the guitar amplifier in the control room so you can adjust those knobs before you adjust the hardware EQ. So you're sitting there with these EQs in front of you whatever they may be. And let's say, you know, I'm, I'm Chris Lord Algae or Algae. I, I forget how to say his name properly. I'm going to take this EQ and I'm just going to listen. Oh, okay. And this thing needs, needs more low end. Okay. I'm going to bring that up. Boost it here. Okay. It sounds good. Move on to the next frequency. Just tweaking stuff until it sounds better. I want this thing to sound better. As good as, as good as it can sound. By the way, with this plugin, you can boost the, uh, the fake preamp a little bit to get some uh, saturation. You want, might want to try doing that. Saturation is good. You can overdo it, but it, it's good. And so again, we're going for what they would do in a real home, uh, in a real professional recording studio. Um, you know, the, the Neve 1081, which is what the EQ81 simulates, or um, the API 550A, which is what this plugin simulates, the, the uh, EQ P50A, which is now called the EQ P5A, and they also changed the, uh, the graphic user inter interface. I'm using the old version because it does look more like the actual hardware, um, but they changed it because they might have got sued. <laughs> um, yeah, knobs were copyrighted or trademarked, apparently. API is typically used gu with guitars, uh, drums. The Neve 1081 is used on pretty much everything. And um, this is a pull tech emulation slash API emulation. These are all just ideas to throw out to you guys, you know, and then... Um, Again, here's another pool tech emulation. So in, in a re typical recording studio, and I say typical, I mean the higher end ones, they will EQ on the way in. So what I like to do is cut with a clean EQ and boost with a character EQ. Uh, again, the, the clean EQs, Pro-Q, PQ33, which is free, Redline, and uh, my character EQs are these two. Um, now, Silk EQ is clean until you put one of your options on Silky Mellow Deep, your saturation options, and then you can change the curves of the EQ. By the way, Slick EQ is free. I highly recommend it. And uh, the, they have a gentleman's edition, which is fairly cheap, and you should get that as well because this plugin kicks ass. Okay, on to compression. Again, compression on the way in at these high-end studios. Now, they did that for two reasons. Number one, they had the hardware, so why not get it? So you wanted to get like a little bit of gain reduction going on. You don't not necessarily want something extreme unless that's what maybe you're going for for an effect. It's all up to you. Whatever sounds good, whatever, you know, this is where you can get creative. 
Um, another compressor that's nice but cheap, DC8C2. The Black 76 is a universal audio slash URI. It's spelled U R E I. 1176 compressor. This is a, a famous compressor. It's been around for a while. Sounds good. Um, and then the white 2A is a simulation of the LA-2A. I like both of these T-Rex plugins because there was a shootout between the real hardware and uh, the plugin, and I thought they sounded pretty damn close. I mean, th this 76 plugin knocked my socks off with extreme gain reduction. Um, again, the, the LA-2A is a compressor that's often used on vocals, bass guitar, um, oddly enough, this plugin sounds nice on snare drum, but these are, f these two compressors are found in a lot of major studios. So again, we're, we're using the same chain that they do. Now, if you want to do this while you're recording, you can do that. You, you can change your options while you're actually recording. Again, the biggest thing to keep in mind is when you take all your plugins off, the level should be set to a, between, I would say, negative 24 dB full scale and negative 12. So this is your optimal point where I'm using the mouse arrow. This is your optimal range when recording. Past that point, you're going to start hearing solid state saturation, which typically sounds like shit on budget gear. You know, and really you want to record with a clean chain because all your saturation is is going to come later with the plugins. The FG Mu or Mu is a it's like a Fairchild 670 slash Manly Labs Very Mu compressor. Um, sounds good. This is the Slate Digital version of it and um, I think typically it's used on vocals, bass guitar, you can try it on anything you want. Um, I saw somebody using this on the drum bus. So, so all these, just to get your recorded sound. Again, the old school way of recording chain is as follows. Talented musician playing a quality instrument in a nice sounding room. Unless you're uh, recording with like a keyboard, synthesizer, that goes direct. Also, bass guitar goes direct. You can also record the uh, the bass amp itself, but typically bass guitars are recorded direct as well as with the amp and then combined later on. Into a nice preamp with an equalizer, then a compressor, and uh, like I said, light touches on the gain reduction when you're using these to simulate recording. And the reason they do all that, I'm going to get to that in a minute. So all these preamp... EQ, compressor, all prior to the recording board, which is now what, what I'm on, Slate VCC, the virtual console collection, simulates the sound of the line input of recording consoles and mixing consoles. So back in the day, after your preamp, if you were going direct, you would take the line output of the preamp and shove it into the console line input. USA simulates an API 1608. So this goes good with this equalizer. Brit N simulates a Neve, I think an 8048 console. I might have that wrong. Um, but that was a famous recording console. And the Trident is, I believe, a Trident 80B which was recorded on a lot of famous rock albums. I think Queen and Elton John. Anyway, good good recording consoles. The Brit 4K is less of a recording console. It was definitely used for recording, but typically this is more of a mixing console. RC Tube, I don't really use this too often. If I'm going to use this plug-in to simulate a recording console, I use, usually use these top three. And then finally, we're coming to the tape plugin. The last in the recording chain, it would come out of the recording console and you would go into a tape machine, two inch, usually 24 track. 
Um, but this plugin simulates 16 track heads, which which sound nicer, by the way. This is a Studer 80. 827 or A827. I'm sorry. I'm getting my model numbers wrong. I'm trying to remember this stuff off the top of my head. But this is a Studer 827 rec recording machine. It's using either Apex 456 or Quantigy GP9 recording tape. And you can either do it at 15 or 30 inches per second. The old school way. The sound of a tape machine, honestly, 15 inches per second. Rarely was 30 inches per second used. And the old school is 456 Quantity GP9 did, did not come out until, I believe, the late 90s. So if you want a cleaner sound, go for 30 inches per second, FG9. But the old school way is at 15 inches per second, 456. And what I like to do, because tape was such a pain in the ass, you set the noise reduction the lowest it can go. Tape was noisy. What I was going to say earlier about the compressors, the reason compressors were used on the way in, two reasons. Limited resources. Unlike with plugins where you can just copy and paste them and you can make a million EQs, a million compressors, whatever, you didn't have that with hardware. You had just your hardware and that's it. So if you wanted to compress a snare drum on the way in or, or, or compress it, period, you would have to record it compressed. And you also want to compress because of the amount of tape noise and the amount of console noise going into the system. So that's it for the recording chain. Um, let me look at my notes and see what else I might have here for you. All right, now this goes back to a video I did about recording live. Another old school way of doing things is recording everything at the same time. You might not have that amount of inputs on your interface though, so you gotta do it track by track, unfortunately. But if you have enough inputs, enough preamps, whatever, if you can record live, not only does it sound better, in my opinion, but it just feels better and you get a lot more accomplished at the same time. Doing things track by track. By the way, I'm wondering, did that change the acoustics on my voice? Um, I have the paper near my, uh, my script near my, my, uh, my mouth. Um, it's actually kind of behind my head. I'm hearing the reflection of the monitor on the back of the paper. This is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm going to take it away now. <laughs> so anyway, the, um, the old way of doing things was live tracking. Every band member at the same time, including the singer. You know, if you want to isolate them in different rooms and run 50 feet cables or whatever, um, you know, you can do that. But um, I, I think it's more enjoyable as a musician tracking live if you have talented enough musicians to do that where you don't need to edit like crazy or really edit at all because the mic bleed will be interesting. But that's how they used to do it. Watch Sound City, the documentary. Um, you know, the old school way is recording live. And uh, I now realize that this video went on longer than I thought it would. And um, that's fine, though. I'll just make this a three-video series. So, yeah, at the end of the chain is your, your tape. So you, you want to do this. I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, you know I'm, I just I have a bunch of different EQs on, but the, record, the real chain would look something more like this. So I have my clean EQ, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use a Neve, going into my LA2A compressor, and then going into my Neve board, going into my Studer tape machine with four, five, six tape. So what's that? Five plugins. And then what I'm gonna do with each track, again, simulating recording, cause the idea is at the end of this, it's gonna be like you're you you know you're mixing with tape. You're going to bounce this track, and this is also to save on CPU. Bounce this track, take ARC off of course, disable it, bypass it. 
and you're, you're going to take your track, bounce it to a new floating point file. I use 32-bit floating point. And then we have our recorded track. You want to save your original recordings just in case you screw up. But I like to do this, you know, one step at a time. And it's an interesting way of working. It doesn't work with everybody. You might not have the patience for this, but I'm telling you guys, I've started working with this in the past uh, two or three years. And my final mixes, my final masters sound phenomenal compared to what I used to do. And I owe it a lot to these newer plugins, these saturation plugins, and these hardware EQ sounding plugins and hardware compressor sounding plugins. All this stuff. Oh, by the way, this should be set to compress. <laughs> I wasn't really messing with the settings on a lot of these plugins. That That's going to go into detail more. Um, but again, everything starts with the monitoring chain with ARC and a decent set of speakers. And um, you'll be amazed, guys. I'm telling you. You, you will be amazed by the difference if you uh, watch this three-part series. So the next video I'm going to make is the mixing video, the old school mixing video. So check that out next. One quick thing I wanted to mention for the recording video is that we are using these plugins while we are setting up to record, but once the setup is done, click your FX bypass because a lot of these plugins take up latency. They will delay what you're recording. And if you're monitoring while you're recording, it's going to sound weird. Um, so you definitely want to disable the effects while you're actually recording the music. But then once you turn the music back on for playback, put the effects in a chain. All right, guys, I just finished editing the first portion of this video, and I wanted to add a few more things that may have confused you. If you have any questions about this, definitely ask. I probably will go into depth in another video about this because it is a different workflow than you might be used to. The idea of this is that we're going to run all these different processors now get a good sound now so that you can free up some CPU usage later on down the line. Now, if you have a really powerful computer, like a high-end computer, you might not need to do all this. You could probably do it all in your doll at the same time. Well, on mine, I know on laptops, you can't do that. So the idea of this is we're going to maintain quality. Yes. And by the way, there's no issue with running VTM or VCC doing it like this, I've talked to the designer of the plugin, Fabrice Gabriel, and you know, even though it's nonlinear stuff, this plugin, even when you group it with the other plugins, every plugin is just running on its own track. So if you run it through the tape plugin or you run it through the console plugin, it doesn't matter. You know, processing it down doesn't matter. The other thing is you should take this opportunity to go through and do vocal comps now do any fixes that you need to do with bass now because some dolls if you go in and start clipping things out cutting things out it won't perform as well so you may as well get your silence in now you know with gating like typically what i'll do is i'll go through on the tom drum microphones and anytime the tom is not being played i'll just take it out i'll take all that extra noise out in the old school days, you would use a noise gate. Essentially, you're doing manual noise gating. And um, the other thing you would do is uh, for vocals, you would take the breaths out. N not always necessarily, but if they'd sound wrong for the song, you might want to take them out now. Noise reduction. I often do noise reduction on direct guitars especially for high gain stuff, it just adds too much noise. So I'll do it now. I'll take out noise from, you know, just anything that's noisy. That, that noise will eventually start adding up and being too much. Now, some people are against noise reduction. Right now, you're listening to noise reduction on my voice. Isotope RX has an excellent noise reduction, and um, I use it on Program D for my voice. 
Program C is also good. As long as you record a noise floor with nobody playing, nobody breathing, nobody making any movements. You know, I do that every time I record a voiceover for these videos. Otherwise, I have a negative 55 decibel noise floor. And then once I start adding my compressors and other things on to the chain, it gets quite noisy. As a matter of fact, I'm going to not noise reduce just this portion of the track so you can hear it. You see, you hear how noisy that is compared to how it used to be. And it used to be even noisier because I had a power supply fan that was really loud. <laughs> and when I had to get my computer fixed recently, I got one that was pretty much noise free. And all I hear now is the hard drive uh, and the processor fans. Actually, the hard drive spinning and the processor fa fan and the... Uh, the fan that shoots air out. So yeah, any housekeeping tasks that you need to do, do it now with the recording chain, noise reduction, declipping, vocal comps, adjusting bass notes to lock in tighter with the drums. You might even want to do a high pass on, on certain tracks that you know might need it. I'll say it in the mix video, but I'll say it again here. I was talking to an old school audio engineer and he said to me that 90% of the mix would get laid down during the recording. And that was because they had to contend with noise from all the analog gear, you know, the tape machines, the console. We have less of that these days due to digital recording. And back then they would have to compress to tape or EQ to tape, because if you EQ tape noise, you're bringing that noise up. And anytime you use an EQ to boost, you're boosting that noise. So on the way in is when they would do it, because the equalizer knobs, the, the equalizer pot totometers, or pots for short, would sound less noisy than once everything else is added into the chain. We really do have it good these days as audio engineers mixing in the box is so much easier from a workflow standpoint, from noise, you know, the, the sonic standpoint. And um, this is just bringing a little bit of the old school mixing philosophies back because we do like that analog tone. Now, if you do have a character preamp, this may or may not work as well. On some of the plugins, you might want to disable the mic preamp. You know, you got to use logic. I'm not going to be able to sit there with you and tell you exactly what you need, but think about it from that standpoint. I've thrown the idea out to you. If you want to go study and see how they used to route things, then go do that. That's what I would recommend. But um, this whole system works really well for me. It's gotten my tone of my mixes and, and uh, my recordings up to par with some really high-end stuff. And, and considering the gear I'm working with, I'm shocked. I love it. I, lo I love that I'm able to get my mixes to the point where they are these days. And um, a lot of that has to do, again, when you start using these analog stages, they add their own bit of distortions and they add a slight bit of compression. So all throughout the chain, you're, you're doing serial compression, which um, I talked about in another video. I guess I'll link that as well. But this is a cool workflow. It's slightly tedious at times, but in the end, it's worth it. And if you set up a recording template, then it makes the task even simpler. But definitely make sure that when you're actually recording to disable the plugins, and actually you might not even, well, you can either disable them, save presets, but you know, you don't want to have any delay while you're recording. It's really important that musicians don't hear themselves in an echo unless, <laughs> you know, you're use, actually using a delay or using a reverb, but you want to make sure there's no latency. Every plugin you use, if you're going to use them, should have zero delay in that. So it's important that you use EQ or if you use Pro Tools, use the HDX or the the uh, the, the HDX DSP plugins if you have that capability. Again, ask me some questions, and I'll make a more in-depth video and answer the questions in that video if you have any problems. This has been Adam for RealHomeRecording.com.